you may have had the opportunity to meet my grandmother. Uh, and if you haven't, let me introduce you to her via a picture. Uh, this is Grandma Billy, my dad's mom, Grandma Billy, to my uh, kid's great-grandma Billy, for short, GGB. She doesn't like it when we call her that, but I think it's kind of cool and trendy, GGB. Uh, and she is a four foot 11 feisty ball of anxiety, it worries about everything all the time. And just this past summer, about a month ago, she turned 98 years old. Hard to believe. Yeah. She's not here, but we can clap for her. That's great. Uh, she's been living with my parents for the last 10 years or so. And this summer, as we were celebrating her uh, birthday, we were at a family dinner. We were just talking to her about the last 10 years of her life. And naturally, as we were talking about the last 10 years of her life, the passing of her husband, my grandfather, Daryl, surfaced in the conversation. And we were just kind of processing that season of life. And somewhere along the way, after her husband had passed and after she kind of grieved the loss of him, somebody asked her the question. She was 90 years old when he passed. There was a six-year difference. He was 96. Somebody asked her, hey, how long do you want to live? Like, now that your husband's gone, your sister's gone, everybody in your family, you're the, you're the only one left. How long do you want to live? And she goes, 98. And we said, oh, why 98? She's like, I got to beat my husband. I got to live beyond him. And two years beyond that seems like a good number. And so this past week, as we were, or like this past month, as we were having this family dinner for her, we like brought that up again. We're like, Grandma, you said you wanted to live to 98. And now you've made it to 98. So the next question is, what is your new number? Like, what year do you want to make it to now? And she just kind of paused and kind of looked in the distance. And she's like, well, shrugged and said, I guess it's got to be 100, right? Like, I got to make it to 100. Now, there's something really inspiring about seeing somebody live an old life. And it raises all sorts of questions like, like how do they do it? Like, how did they make it that many years? And it's really inspiring to see somebody live uh, that long. But at the same time, it, it's also sobering. Because when you get to that point in life, you know that you are so much closer to the end of your life than you are to the beginning of your life. And when you're young and you're in your 20s, like, you think you're untouchable. You're like, I'm, I'm going to live forever. I'm immortal. Nothing is going to stop me. But then when you hit your 40s, the awareness of your decline starts to increase because you don't recover as fast. And you start to feel all these aches and pains. And you just get tired more quickly than you did when you were younger. And then once you hit your 60s, all of a sudden, you can remember people in your life who have passed in their 60s. And you start to realize, oh, I'm now outliving them. And so as you move through different stages of life, the reality of the end of your life starts to surface and become very apparent. So about a week after we had dinner with my grandmother to celebrate her birthday, we just had another family dinner, and my mom was there, and she started to tell us, my mom turned 70 this year, and she started to tell us recently she got a phone call from her brother, my uncle, saying that he was just diagnosed with kidney cancer. And so we started processing what that meant, how you treat kidney cancer, what his treatment was going to be, how long it was going to take. And we were just then processing other people in our lives who we've known who have had battles with cancer. And somewhere along the way, my mom said, you know, it's one thing when your parent dies. It's another thing, though, when your siblings in old age have a brush with death because then that causes you to realize that death for you might be closer than you're comfortable admitting. Again, when you're young, it feels like, hey, I'm untouchable. Nothing's going to get me down. But as you get older and you start to see other people in your life have brushes with death or your parents die or siblings die or even close friends die, it gets you automatically rethinking and reevaluating your own life. And that's not just true with family and friends, but it's also true with Jesus. Meaning when we read through the Gospels and we read about Jesus' life, the point of the way that the Gospel writers write about Jesus' life 
is to get us to contemplate our own life and in, in also our own death and start to ask questions about how do I make the most of this life knowing that the end is eventually going to come. Now, we're at this point in John's gospel where Jesus' proximity to his death and the awareness of his death starts to rise and become front and center in John's story of Jesus' life. And in chapter 11, the chapter just before the chapter we're in now, Jesus miraculously raises Lazarus back from the dead. And then as we enter into chapter 12, he's entering into Jerusalem with Lazarus in tow and this massive crowd of people. There's all of this fanfare following Jesus as he enters into Jerusalem, in large part because of the Passover. But once he gets into Jerusalem with all of this fanfare, the very next thing that he does in John's gospel is he starts to talk about his death and what his death means for everybody else. This is what we read. This is John chapter 12, starting in verse 20. We read this. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to, the, to worship at the festival. Just notice that John is referencing Greeks. Usually when festivals are mentioned in John's gospel, it's mentioned that there are all of these other Jews who have come to worship at the festival. But here he says there are Greeks. We should hold on to that, file that away. We'll come back to that. These Greeks, verse 21, came to Philip, who is from Bethsaida in Galilee, and requested, sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and, and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. So Jesus comes to Jerusalem, and right away there's a group of people wanting to see him, which is no big surprise, because people are always trying to see Jesus, get around him, hear from him, learn from him, wherever he goes. But what's interesting about this story is that Jesus doesn't even seem to acknowledge their request. He doesn't seem to say yes. He doesn't seem to say no. Right away, he starts talking in somewhat cryptic terms about his death. And the reason we know he's talking about his death is because if we jump to the end of this passage, we look at verse 33, it said, he said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. And so what this passage does for us is it highlights the implications and the realities of Jesus' death. Because Jesus' death wasn't just another passing of a well-known religious leader. His death had huge effects, not only for the disciples, not only for us, but for the entire world. And this passage kind of highlights all of that for us. Because Jesus goes on to say this. We learn, first and foremost, that Jesus' death is an intentional death. Because we read in verse 23, Jesus replied, assumingly to the request of the Greeks, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, if you've paid attention through John's gospel, you've noticed the re repetition of the term, the hour. He uses it early on in his gospel, specifically in chapter 2. He's at a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. The, the wine for this wedding has run out. Jesus' mother goes to him to tell him, hey, this is what's going on, implying, hey, can you fix this? Can you do something about it? And he looks at his mom and he says, why are you telling me this? My hour has not come. And then you see it again in chapter 7 and chapter 8, because as John's story about Jesus continues, tension around who Jesus is and what he's all about begins to rise as the story moves forward. And in chapter 7 and in chapter 8, he's teaching in the temple, and the religious leaders in the temple are watching him. They're trying to find a way to plot and kill him. It says that they want to arrest him, but we see repeatedly in chapter 7 and chapter 8 that no one seized him. No one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. So John writes his gospel in a way with this growing anticipation, this growing tension, and this question, what is this hour all about, and when is it going to get here? Just like a kid in a car trip. Are we there yet? Are we yet there yet? When, when are we going to get there? Are we there yet? 
You read through John's gospel and he's writing it in a way to get you to ask that question. Are we there yet? When is this hour coming? What is this hour all about? And then you cross into chapter 12, this part of chapter 12, and it says his hour has now come, signifying this is the point. This is the point of John's gospel. This is why he's writing this story about Jesus in the first place. This is the point of Jesus' life on earth. This is the moment people have been waiting for, and he comes into Jerusalem, and in this moment, he doesn't start a revolution. He doesn't seek to overthrow the empire. He comes to lay down his life. It's an intentional, sacrificial death but it's also a fertile death. Because as soon as Jesus mentions his hour has come, he starts to use an agricultural illustration to highlight the effects of his death. We read this in verse 24. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now, in agriculture and horticulture, The hope is to cultivate life. I'm not great at growing things. I tend to kill things. I can build things, but I'm not great at growing things. But the hope is to bring about life with the purpose to enjoy what you have grown. Whether to enjoy the beauty of it, if it's flowers and flowers of many colors to kind of spruce up your house or your yard, or to enjoy it by way of consuming it if what you're growing is fruit and produce. The hope is that you will cultivate life to enjoy what grows, but that end result of enjoyment actually starts in death. Because in order to get to that end result, you first have to take a seed, and you have to bury it, all the while knowing that when you bury it, that seed is going to be ripped apart and destroyed. Like you see a simple picture of a seed in the ground, and the progression that it goes through in order to produce life, you see initially you put this seed in the ground, and after a matter of time, maybe a few weeks, I don't know, maybe a month or so, the seed rips apart. The seed breaks down, and life starts to emerge from the ground. And it's not just the case for one flower or one crop or one piece of fruit, but the hope is that this life that emerges from this one seed will continue to spread and create more life and more plants and more fruit. This is a picture from one of the flower beds in our backyard. Um, I, I don't know what the, again, I'm not a plant guy. I don't know what the green and yellow plant is. I'm sure some of you recognize it, and I'm sure some of you are going to come and tell me what it is after service, which is fine. I don't know what it is. I think it looks nice. I do know what's next to it is called lamb's ear. Now, we planted this lamb's ear just last summer, and it has blown my mind how much lamb's ear there is in our flower bed, because when we planted it just last summer, it looked like this, this other little picture, just this one little shoot, this one little shoot of lamb's ear, and then all of a sudden it died, again, over the winter, like you would anticipate. And this year, it came back with a vengeance. It was like, I'm going to take over this garden. I don't care what other plants are around. I'm going to be the dominant plant here. It has just grown. It has spread. I'm assuming if we don't do anything with it this fall, it's going to die again, and it's only going to get bigger and more widespread throughout our flower bed. Jesus is saying that his death hopefully brings life. And not life just for one individual, but that that life will spread far and wide. And this idea, again, isn't only about plants. Jesus' point isn't that it's about plants, but this idea of life coming through death is also true of people. Because what Jesus' death does is it provides life. Again, not just for one person. It provides life for the world. But in order to receive it, you first have to be willing to lose it. Meaning in order to receive the life that Jesus gives, you first have to be willing to lose and surrender your own life. That's what he says in verse 25. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. 
while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Again, you have this cryptic saying of Jesus. What does it mean to love your life versus lose your life or hate your life? You would think loving your life is a good thing, but here Jesus uses that in a negative way. He says, if you hate your life, that's actually a good thing. And basically what he's trying to capture with this idea of using the contrast of love versus hate is if you love your life, you cling to the life that you have. But if you hate your life, you surrender it and you're willing to release it back to him. See, oftentimes we think that true life, true living is found in certain sources of this world. Meaning we often think that true life is found in certain relationships that we can possess or success and achievement that we can attain or through accumulating more and living a comfortable, cushy life. But Jesus says those aren't sources of true life. And because we tend to believe, maybe we don't actually verbally say that, but the way that we live communicates that we believe that those sources are the ultimate source of life. And when we believe that, we tend to cling to those things, thinking they will give us a life they were never intended to give. Many years ago, John Steinbeck wrote a book called The Pearl that maybe you had to read in high school. If you are in high school now, you might have to read it. And it's a story of this pearl diver named Kino who lives on a little coastal village in Mexico and every day he pulls out his canoe. He goes out into the ocean in his canoe and he dives down to the bottom of the ocean looking for pearls that he can take back and sell. And one day he's diving and he finds this pearl that's bigger than any pearl he has ever found. And he has all of these desires and dreams for his life. He's got a young son at home and he hopes that This pearl will provide the opportunity for his son to have education. His son is also sick, and he's hoping this pearl will provide the means to get medicine to make him well. And he thinks, this pearl is going to change my life. And so he quickly hides it. He puts it back into his canoe. He goes back into town and starts to tell his wife about this. And he says, hey, don't tell anybody about this, because this is our ticket to the good life that we've longed for. But as you might expect, word gets out in the village that Kino has found this pearl. And this pearl doesn't actually fix life for him. It makes life more complicated for him. Because everybody else in the town tries to get the pearl from Kino. They, they try to mug him and rob him. They break into his house. They even burn down his house. His family have to run and flee for their lives. And there comes a point where his wife tells him, hey, take that stupid pearl. That thing is ruining our life. Take that stupid pearl, go to the edge of the ocean and throw it back into the sea and put it back where it came from. And he says, I can't. I can't do it. He said, this pearl has become my soul. And if I lose it, it would be like losing my very soul soul. See, sometimes when we cling to these things that we think give us life, we have this inability to let them go because they're so intertwined with our understanding of ourself to the point that it feels like, oh, if I let this go, this relationship or this thing, and it's not even that I actually have to let it go. I just have to hold it empty-handed. It could feel, or open-handed, it could feel like I'm losing my very soul. And when we cling to these things, what happens is it affects our heart in that our heart becomes not fertile soil for kingdom growth, but it becomes barren soil, desolate soil, soil that nothing can actually grow in because it's lost the plot on what actually brings life. And what Jesus is trying to highlight here is simply this, that the way of death ultimately leads to life. The way of death for Jesus ultimately leads to life. And what truly brings life is living your life in service 
and surrender to Jesus. That's what he says next in verse 26. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. See, when you let go of the things that you think will bring you life, and you open yourself to God, and you posture yourself in surrender to say yes to whatever God might call you to, you start on the path of life. You start on the path to experiencing life the way that God designed it, meaning you were intended to find all of who you are in who Jesus is. You were created to reflect God's life back to him through experiencing it with him in partnership, in service to him and the world. You start experiencing life the way that God intended it to be. Now, that doesn't mean it will be easy. That doesn't mean just surrendering these things, these hopes and dreams that you had for your life will ultimately just be a piece of cake. Because even in this moment, we see that Jesus is struggling with what it means to live his life in surrender, in service to the Father. He says this in verse 27. Now my soul is troubled. It's troubled. It's stirred up. It's torn. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So Jesus is surrendering to his Father. He's willing to live his life in service to his Father. And as he does, he ends up glorifying his Father. And then in this moment, you have this incredible supernatural thing where like the voice of God just breaks into the world. And we read this. It says, Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it and said it thundered. Others said it was an angel that had spoken to him. So not only is Jesus' death intentional and fertile, it's also a glorifying death. When we walk in surrender and service to God, when we relinquish control of our life, God is naturally honored. And that was Jesus' whole ministry. When he says, I have glorified it, most likely he's referring to Jesus' entire ministry. Because we see repeatedly in Jesus' ministry, he's lived his life in surrender to God. It'll say in John 5, and Jesus is in this heated discussion with the Pharisees because he's healed on the Sabbath and they think this guy is a maniac. He is somebody who goes against the law. We need to do away with him. Jesus says, hey, 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 I, I live my life not on my own terms. I simply do what I see the Father doing. He's the one who is ultimately always present and at work and I'm just following his lead. He'll say later in chapter 12, not only do I just do whatever I see the Father doing, I say only what the Father says. These words that I speak are not my own. They're actually his words from him. So I only do what he does. I only say what he says. I'm living my life in full surrender to him. Now that raises the question, does Jesus' death bring glory to God just because He's walking in surrender? Or is there more that's happening with Jesus' death that ultimately also brings glory to God? And what we see near the back end of this passage is that there are two other things. There are two other things that are happening with Jesus' death that ultimately bring glory and honor to the Father. Because not only is Jesus' death intentional, and fertile, and glorifying, it's also a conquering death, meaning specifically it conquers evil. Verse 31, now is the time for judgment on this world, which sounds like a really strong statement. And I don't know if Jesus is referring so much to the people of this world, because he says in the very next half of the verse, now the prince of this world, referring to Satan, will be driven out. It sounds like he's saying what will happen is the judgment that's coming, at least with this verse, is referencing the judgment on the evil one who is running rampant in our world. And what Jesus is saying is that his death on the cross ultimately triumphs over evil. 
specifically because it exposes evil for what it is. It puts on full display that the evil of this world has no match, is no match for the power that's found in and through Jesus. Jesus' death conquers it, disarms it, makes it obsolete. And how does it do that? By exposing it for what it is. A, a handful of years ago, Clint Eastwood put out a movie called Gran Torino. Anybody seen this movie? A, a pretty intense movie. Uh, it's not a family-friendly film, so don't go watch it with your kids tonight. Like, oh, this will be fun. The pastor mentioned it in church. Don't show it to your kids. <laughs> uh, it's a really intense film. This is a story about this older gentleman played by Ken, Clint Eastwood. His name is Walt. He's lived in this one neighborhood his whole life. And as he's gotten older, the neighborhood around him has started to change. The, the big change is that gangs have started to come into the neighborhood. Gang activity and gang violence is really high. And there's this neighbor boy who lives next to him who's got a cousin in a gang. And what happens through the course of the movie is his cousin in this gang pressures him to rob Clint Eastwood as their next door neighbors. And specifically what he wants this boy to steal is Clint Eastwood's beautiful car, a Grand Torino. He has it sitting in his car. He wants him to steal it. So this boy, feeling the pressure from his cousin who's in a gang, tries to steal this car but gets caught by Clint Eastwood. And what happens over the course of the movie, Clint Eastwood's this really rough, gruff guy who doesn't like the way that his neighborhood is changing and tries to isolate himself and keep people at arm's distance. He ends up befriending this boy, and he ends up, protecting this boy and his family from his cousin in this gang. And there comes this moment in the movie where the gang attacks this boy's sister, abuses her terribly, and Clint Eastwood has this realization that this family will never be safe with this gang still present in the neighborhood. So he devises a plan to get rid of this gang. And he realizes the best way to do it is by exposing who they are, for the evil that they do. So he shows up one night outside this gang house filled with gang members. He's got a jacket on, looking cool. And he just stands there, knowing at some point they will see that he's there and get their attention. He just stands there. And somebody in the gang realizes he's there. There's been tension rising between him and the gang all movie. So they're like ready to come out there and pick a fight with him. And he just stands there and doesn't say much, kind of like you would expect Clint Eastwood to do. And he reaches into his pocket. And they get really nervous, and they draw guns on him. And what he does is he pulls a cigarette out of his pocket and puts it in his mouth. It's just like barely hanging on like it would. And then he asks one question. He's like, anybody got a light? And everybody starts yelling profanities at him with guns drawn. And he's like, I've got a light. And he puts his hand in his inside pocket. And what they think is that he's going for a gun. And he pulls it out. And as soon as he pulls it out, he, the gang unloads on him, killing him, putting him back. And the scene shows that as he falls to the ground, his hand opens up, and what's in his hand is just a lighter for his cigarette. See, he knew that by positioning himself in that way and making that gesture, they would open fire, and he devised this plan to sacrifice his life for the sake of the neighborhood. Because as soon as this commotion happens, all the neighbors around these two houses come to watch. And by laying his life down, he exposes the gang for what they are, exposes them for the evil that they possess. And the very next shot is the police coming to arrest all the gang members for the assassination of this guy who is just trying to protect his neighborhood. He disarmed the powers of the evil in his neighborhood through a sacrificial death. Jesus' death is the same for us. It exposes the evil one for who he is, for killing an innocent man who has committed no sin, who has done no wrong, who has taken on the sin of the world so that the world might have life. It's the way of Jesus' death that ultimately brings life. Because we read in John 10, the evil one comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. And by disarming the powers of the evil one through his sacrificial death, Jesus enables life to be cultivated in the here and now. 
And so Jesus' death is intentional, it's fertile, it glorifies God because it conquers evil. And then the last thing it is, is missional. Because the way that this passage ends in verse 32 is he says, and when I am lifted up from the earth, I will start to draw, I will draw all people to myself. Go back to the beginning of the passage. Who's there? Who's showing up? Who's asking to see Jesus? It's not Jews. It's Greeks. Those who are not Jews. Jesus' ministry all through his life was said to be focused on the Jewish people. He had come to call the lost sheep of Israel and even at times resist reaching out to people who aren't Jewish. But here we see there's a decisive moment. Jesus' ministry, his life, his death isn't just for the people of Israel. It's for the entire world. And now you're starting to see people who don't have Jewish background or heritage come to Jesus because they're drawn to him because they know that in him and him alone is life. And so Jesus' death is a missional death. It's intended to be not just for you and me, but for the entire world. And so this raises the question for us. Like, what does that mean for you? Like, how do you view Jesus' death? Do you view it just as fire insurance? It's my get-out-of-hell-free card? It's something that I stick in my back pocket, and when I get to the other side of this life, I can pull it out and show, like, I did it. I received Jesus, I checked the box, or does his death illuminate the bigger picture of his life and ministry and his kingdom? Do you see that the way to life in Jesus' kingdom comes through death, which means in order for you to experience that life, at some level, you have to let something in your life die. And the question is, what is that for you? What is that thing you're clinging to? What's that thing you're holding on to? Thinking like, this is my source of life, when all the while, it's destroying your life. And you maybe don't even have eyes to see it. But when you open your life to God, when you surrender that thing, then you have the potential for his kingdom life to grow. And so what is that for you? What is that thing that God is inviting you? Maybe he's not inviting you to completely discard it, but he's just inviting you to open your hands, to release the grip on it, so that you might be postured for him maybe to take it, but also to put something better in its place. What is that for you? My question for you this morning is, can you identify that? Can you name it? And maybe what you need to do is you just simply need to write that thing down. You need to write down what that is. Maybe it's something you do have. Maybe it's something you do possess. Or maybe it's just a hope or dream or some kind of desire. Jesus, through his death, seeks to give you life. It's a way better life than you could ever imagine. He says in John 10 that it's an abundant life, the life that is truly life. But in order to receive it, we may first need to let something die. So may you see that the way to life comes through death. May you be willing to surrender all that you have to him and may you find that there is a life waiting for you that is far better than you could ever imagine. Lord, we thank you so much for the love of Jesus. We thank you so much for the way that he has given all he has for us. May we have awareness of what his death brings. May we be open to surrendering it all to you. And may we find that in turn, what comes our way is the life that we've always wanted, the life that we were initially intended to live because it's a life that is completely wrapped up in you. We love you, Lord. We declare that you are the true King of kings who through your sacrificial death has launched a kingdom 
that will never go away. I pray this in your name. Amen.